Okay, in this lecture, we take a look at the last topic associated with this unit on momentum, and it has to do with one of the details that we skipped over when talking about explosions and collisions. What we skipped over in those situations was describing the internal forces that occur between the objects themselves during an explosion or during a collision. That's what we're going to do here. Before we do, however, I have to take you through a more general means or an alternative way of describing Newton's second law, F equals ma. When you are first introduced to Newton's second law, F equals ma, you are done so in that manner, and you're done so in the context of a single object, which we just simply treat as a point. However, what happens if you're talking about a system of objects or you're talking about a distribution of matter? There's a more general way of describing Newton's second law, and this is how Newton himself did in Principia, which he published in 1687. So let me take you through this alternative means of describing Newton's second law first. Okay, now Newton's second law, of course, as you originally saw it, is F equals MA. However, there's a more general way of writing this situation or writing this expression for a system of objects or for a distribution of matter of some sort. Now, acceleration, of course, is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Like so. Now, for those of you enrolled in Honors Physics AB or in AP Physics C, of course, this is how you see a derivative. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. In just a few moments, I will rewrite what I'm about to do here for those of you that are enrolled in the algebra-based course, Physics AB. At any rate, however, this quantity right here is actually the same thing as this. Derivative with respect to time of mass times velocity. If the mass of a system, for example, is a, is a constant, you could pull it out of the derivative, and you then end up with this step right here, which is, of course, F equals MA. However, a more general way of describing this derivative is this expression here. This expression here takes into account, for example, systems of variable mass. A system involving a variable mass would be like, for example, a rocket expelling gas as the engine fires. This quantity, of course, right here in the parentheses is momentum. So then, therefore, a more general way of describing Newton's second law is that the sum of the forces, that's still the left-hand side of the expression, results in the change in the momentum of the system with respect to time. This is how you write Newton's second law for a single object. If you're talking about a distribution of matter or if you're talking about a system of some sort, then the left-hand side of the expression is the sum of the external forces is equal to the change in the momentum of the center of mass of the system with respect to time. Okay, now this is showing all the derivatives associated with this expression. Here's how I show it algebraically for those of you that are enrolled in physics AB. It's much the same process, except we'll use the limit notation. So for example, start with F equals MA. Okay, write then acceleration on the right-hand side of the expression as the limit as time approaches zero of change in velocity with respect to time. And then I'm writing the mass m here in the numerator of the expression so we can see right here the change in the momentum of the system with respect to time. Like so. Okay, this statement right here, of course, for those of you that do have some calculus experience, is the equivalent of the following right here. And then therefore, once again, if you're talking about a system or if you're talking about a distribution of matter, then the left-hand side of the expression is as follows. The sum of the external forces is equal to the change in the momentum of the center of mass with respect to time. So without using the derivative notation, this quantity right here is the equivalent of this quantity right here. This is the most general way of writing Newton's second law. It takes into account any possible situation. The easiest way to describe it is that the sum of the forces acting on a system results in the change in the momentum of the center of mass of this system with respect to time. That's the most general way to describe Newton's second law. Okay, keeping that in mind. 
Let's now go ahead and get to our topic involving an examination of the internal forces that occur between objects undergoing an explosion or a collision. The topic itself that we're going to cover here is called impulse. Okay, exactly what impulse is, we'll see over the course of this description. Okay, now let's picture a collision. For example, I was using these carts to simulate various collisions in situations that we examined earlier in this unit. And then I have these elastic bands attached to these carts. And then what happens slowly over time is that the two carts collide like so, and as they do, the bands here, they compress. They compress to a maximum value. So then therefore, the value of the internal force that occurs between these two objects very rapidly goes from a value of zero at the point of first contact and then shoots up to a maximum value when these bands compress as far as they're going to go. And then just as rapidly, that force then goes from that maximum value back down to zero once again at the point of last contact as the two carts separate from each other. In other words, when the carts collide together, they deform in some manner. This actually happens between objects that are seemingly very rigid, for example, as well. It's obvious in the case of these carts with these elastic bands, but it's also the case when you are having two very rigid objects collide together. You're never going to notice the deformation of the objects themselves during the collision with the naked eye because the process simply happens far too quickly. But by using what is called high-speed photography, you can actually see the deformation of the objects fairly easily. High-speed photography, for example, is when you take hundreds or thousands of frames of photographs per second, and therefore you could see very fast processes occur at a much slower rate. So let me show you an example. I have a picture here on my screen of using high-speed photography, what happens when a baseball bat collides with a baseball. I'm going to have to move my camera in order for you to see. So bear with me here as I do. Like so, and I'll go ahead and zoom in a bit. Okay, and then if you take a look at the photograph there between the baseball and the baseball bat very carefully, you'll see that the baseball in particular is very noticeably deformed, but the baseball bat is as well. All of this, of course, occurs over a very short interval of time, a few hundredths or maybe even a few thousandths of a second, but during that short interval of time, the two objects actually noticeably deform. This occurs even with seemingly very rigid objects. Okay, let me go back now like so, okay? Okay, now how do we then describe the behavior mathematically of these internal forces that occur between the two objects? Well, let's picture it in the following way involving a collision, for example, between these two objects. Okay, so let's conceptualize here a collision. So we have our two carts. So here's the first cart, mass M1, with initial velocity V1 naught. Here's the second cart, mass M2, with initial velocity V2 naught. And this then, of course, is describing the situation prior to the collision. And then after the collision, the objects bounce off each other in some manner. So here's M1 with a V1 final. Okay, here's M2 with a V2 final. And then earlier in this unit, we set up situations involving conservation of momentum for the elastic collision conservation of kinetic energy, blah, blah, blah. Went through all of our math and then solved for V1 final, for example, and V2 final. Here's what we skipped over, however. What actually happens during the collision? Okay, so during the collision, we've got here M1 and M2 and they exert equal and opposite forces upon each other from Newton's third law. So for example, right here, there is a force on two due to one. Right here is an equal and opposite force on one due to two. How do you mathematically describe these forces? Once again, we do so using these elastic bands. There is a very characteristic graph that is produced force as a function of time, 
that describes the mathematical behavior of either of these forces. Now, because these forces are the same in magnitude, it doesn't really matter which one I talk about. So let's take a look at the force on one due to two. Okay, so here's the behavior of the force on one due to two. And what we do is we graph it out as a function of time. And then the graph that is characteristically produced in such a manner looks like this. Like so. Where right here is the point of first contact, for example, between the parts. And then as the elastic bands, com bands compress and deform, very rapidly the value of the force goes from zero and shoots up to a maximum value. And then just as rapidly as the carts separate from each other, that force goes from its maximum value back down to zero, once again, right here at the point of what is called last contact. When you're talking about very rigid objects, the total amount of time from one side of the curve to the other is in the neighborhood of a few milliseconds, a few thousandths of a second. Okay, now here's then how we mathematically describe this graph. We do so by using Newton's second law, but we do so in its general form, that is the following. We're talking about the force on one due to two. Just for simplicity, if this is the only force that's being exerted upon cart number one, then from Newton's second law, this is equal to the change in the momentum of cart number one with respect to time. Okay, move the time interval here up to the left-hand side of the expression. Like so. And now what we'll do is we'll integrate both sides of the expression. Integrate the left-hand side over time. Integrate the right-hand side over momentum. Now the right-hand side of the expression is easy. It's ultimately just the change in the momentum of cart number one. For those of you enrolled in physics AB, we'll just leave it as this description here. However, what is the left-hand side? Well, notice that the left-hand side, this integral, is describing the area underneath this curve. Like so. The area underneath this curve is given a name. It's referred to as impulse. So this quantity right here is referred to as impulse, and it's given the letter J. Now, I'm writing all of this as a one-dimensional case, so I've been dropping the vector notation. But technically speaking, it is a vector quantity. This right here is the impulse delivered, as we say. Sometimes we say it is the impulse that's imparted to cart number one. It is a vector quantity, as I said, even though I'm only describing this for a one-dimensional case. Now, this is a new quantity, so let's go ahead and check the units. The units of impulse are actually the same thing as the units of momentum, kilogram meter per second. But the units of momentum are not really descriptive of this graph. Instead, what's more descriptive of this graph is force times time, which is referred to then, therefore, as Newton seconds. Okay, now, don't be concerned about this integral. There is, in fact, a function that is used to describe this graph here. Ultimately, it can be integrated, blah, blah, blah. That's not important for our purposes. What we'll do is we'll approximate what the graph looks like, and we'll approximate then the left-hand side of this expression, what is referred to as impulse. This will also be key for those of you enrolled in Physics AB. Here's how we can approximate this graph. We'll approximate that graph, the rather complicated function describing that spike, as it's sometimes referred to as, by the way. What we'll do is we'll just approximate it as a rectangle. Like so. So here's a graph of the force on one due to two as a function of time. And then ultimately right here, we'll just approximate that spike as a rectangle. Now the width of the rectangle is the time interval, delta t, over which the collision occurs. Once again, usually in the neighborhood of a few hundredths or a few thousandths of a second. Okay, and then the height of the rectangle here is not quite the same thing as the maximum value of the force from the graph from earlier. Instead, it's the average value of the force that occurs as the two objects collide. So the height here is the average force on one, two, to two. And now the area of this rectangle is just base times height. It's force times time. 
So then therefore, I'll rewrite this expression in the following way. The impulse J on one do to two is equal to the average force on one do to two multiplied by time. This is the same thing as the change in momentum of cart number one. Okay, now why do we bother to describe this new quantity called impulse? Because essentially all that we're really doing here is just looking at a piece of Newton's second law. The reason why we bother to describe it is basically twofold. Number one, the definition of it itself mathematically is describing this graph. It's describing the area, for example, of this rectangle. And then secondly, the reason why we bother to define it is because it's actually really easy to measure. It's really easy to measure because all that it's equal to is the change in momentum of the object itself. So then therefore, if you know what the change in the momentum of cart number one is, you know what the impulse is that's delivered to it. The hard thing to get out of all of this is the force itself. Because in order to measure the force that occurs between the two objects, you need to know the time interval. The only way in which you can realistically measure that is, for example, by using high-speed photography. Okay, we'll just take a look at one example involving impulse. I'll do that in the second part of this lecture.